Warning, this podcast will offend assholes. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by the new Jesus-themed pizzeria, Deuteromino's. Come on down and get a pizza with all the crucifixions at Deuteromino's, where crust is king. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, I'm Mara. My experience teaching science in Japan and Australia confirms a couple things that you probably already knew. First, that teachers everywhere deserve better working conditions, better pay, and a lot more respect. And second, It's March 28th. And it's Weed Appreciation Day. Well, every day. No, no like, not, not that kind of weed. But, but still, I'm no illusions. <laughs> I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Allen Ginsberg's, New Jersey, Ooh. Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, the Supreme Court of Louisiana rules that the Catholic Church was on base. Ted Cruz continues being hated by everyone ever, ever, ever. And Don Ford continues doing the exact opposite. But first, the diatribe. The program is called LifeWise Academy. So you already probably hate it, right? You can already tell it's evil. Yeah, it's a program that preys on Ohio school children. And as I learned about it, there was just this steady echo of how the fuck is this legal? repeating in the back of my head the whole time. Here's what it does. It takes a bus to local schools. It picks up a bunch of kids, takes them to church, teaches them about how awesome Jesus is, gives them candy and prizes to bring back and flaunt to all their non-Christian classmates, along with invitation slips they can give to their friends to encourage them to also become Christian, and then sends them on their way. And no, this is not an after-school program. This happens during the fucking school day. Kids do this instead of like gym class. Now, think about that. Imagine yourself as one of the students who wasn't going to LifeWise Academy that day. Now, first of all, all the kids who, who do go to it wear a special red T-shirt that day, right? These sneeches have stars. So from minute one, you're outgrouped. Then when you go to the gym class, the, the worst of all the fucking classes, you get to watch them pile on a big red bus together and sing songs that you don't know. Then when you get back to homeroom... They come in all giddy to show off their new stickers or magnets or whatever. All you got from gym class was a couple of fucking bruises and the awkward trauma of being naked in front of your peers. They got magnets and stickers. And just then, when you're at maximal jealousy, they break out their invitation notes. You could do it too. You could skip your least favorite class once a month or once a week or whatever. You could get cool prizes, eat candy, be part of the club. All you have to do is change religions. 10-year-olds. Now, and, and keep in mind that if these kids convert enough of their classmates, they're rewarded with a pizza party or an ice cream party. So you're getting hit with some damn motivated evangelism. And somehow, all of that is legal. Apparently, there are a pair of Supreme Court cases from 1948 and 1952 that allow for religious instructions during public school hours, provided it takes place off campus, isn't paid for through tax dollars, and isn't promoted by the schools. Mormons have taken advantage of it in Utah for decades, as have Jewish groups in New York. But just because it can be done legally doesn't mean it is being done legally. The Freedom from Religion Foundation has received at least a half dozen complaints from concerned parents in Ohio who believe their schools did promote the program. In one instance, the school's fucking principal walked a volunteer from classroom to classroom on the first day of school so he could tell kids about the program. Hard to imagine what promotion even is if it's not that. There was even one case where a teacher shared a LifeWise permission slip with a Hindu girl. A, a, a tutor that was in the classroom tried to intervene, tried to stop her. And the teacher defended herself by saying she was, quote, just telling her about Jesus, end quote. I was just trying to switch her to the right religion. What's wrong with you people? But, but, but even when they do stay inside the bounds of the law, it's fucking disgusting. LifeWise's founder brags about what a high percentage of the students that attend his academy are from low-income households. He's trying to sell it as, look at us, we're, we're offering something nice to the least fortunate. But in reality, that just makes it all the more heinous. They're offering candy and pizza parties to children with food insecurity on the condition that they worship Jesus Christ. 
And of course, this isn't the kind of thing anyone else can take advantage of, right? Minority religions could do stuff like this, sure, and some of them do, right? But you can bet your ass the Muslim version of LifeWise doesn't get led from classroom to classroom to give their spiel. And there's no way in hell the Muslim version sends kids back to school with you too could worship Allah pamphlets for their friends. This is one of the many instances where only the majority can abuse this rule. I mean, if the fucking Muslim kids at a school in rural Ohio wore a special T-shirt on that day, it sure as hell wouldn't make the rest of the school feel outgrouped. This is just another reminder that if you want to know what they're doing, just look at what they're accusing us of. Right. Their boogeyman du jour is the liberals grooming their children. Now, they say grooming because that's more lurid than the thing they actually mean. But what they're actually accusing us of doing is indoctrinating children. They're accusing us of using the schools to promote our ideological agenda, because when you're bigoted enough, tolerance becomes an ideological agenda. But the whole time they're freaking out about Heather having two mommies, they're doing this kind of shit. They're literally rounding children up for indoctrination class. They're trying to replace school counselors with school chaplains. They're coercing children to pray with them on the 50-yard line. They're meeting at the flagpole. They're fighting to reintroduce mandatory prayers in schools. They're sneaking religious horse shit into science textbooks. Oh, and they're also literally grooming our children. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Woody and Buzz of this podcast, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you ready to play? Okay. In the original draft, I was an evil ventriloquist dummy. Now, that would have been a good movie, right? Hell yeah. Right? And like Buzz Lightyear, my gay friends are ruining Disney. So yeah, this is all <laughs> working out. Yeah, it's all coming together. There you go. In our lead story tonight, Louisiana Supreme Court says it's okay to molest kids if you're good at it. Or at least that's the message they sent when they struck down a law that would relax statutes of limitation on child sex abuse charges because, and this can't be said too often, there is no non-evil reason for there to be statutes of limitation on child sex abuse. Sure are Pure evil. Yeah. So back in 2021, Louisiana passed a look-back window law. that it, it eliminates deadlines for victims of child sex abuse seeking redress. What's more, the law passed unanimously. And in passing the law, the legislature specifically cited research that shows the average age where male victims of child sex abuse come forward is 52. And this isn't a law unique to Louisiana, by the way. 26 states and the District of Columbia have all passed similar laws. And in 24 and a half of those fucking states, the laws were found to be just fucking fine. But in the South's most Catholic state, they were found to be unconstitutional. The only other state court that agrees with them is the one from fucking Utah. Shocking. Wait. Are you telling me that pseudo-theocracies don't want to follow the laws? The hell you say? Okay, their law for prosecuting pedophiles said, uh, limited time only, act now. Yes. Not great. And that absurd fucking infomercial of a law was struck down for not being absurd and evil enough. Right. Yes. The, the four, three majority on Louisiana's court found that the look back window law violated due process because the alleged child rapists were already on base when the law was passed. And if we pass these kind of laws retroactively, why we, we might wind up in a world where no child rapist ever feels safe again. And of course, in striking down the law, they give molesters license to molest and the institutions they work for all the incentive in the world to cover up the, for their crimes. Okay. Why would you want to bother someone about the child molestation they did decades ago is the best version of their argument. Yep. It's the best and version. And to be clear, we are not in the best version. We are in like, call in the next 10 minutes and, well, nobody's picking up because the horn sounded. We have a horn, by the way, for this. Yeah. <sighs> we have a bass, a terrifying bass. Mm. Now, of course, there is one Supreme Court in the United States that might be even more theocratic than the ones in Louisiana and Utah, and that's the one that gets to hear this bullshit next. And as devastating a blow as this decision is to abuse victims in Louisiana, it stands to be far worse if the Supreme Court also moves to protect institutionalized child rape. This could lead to 24 similar laws being struck down all over the country, as well as existing judgments getting overturned. And since six members of the Supreme Court are horrendous monsters and a seventh is a Catholic whose humanity slips noticeably when the subject of religion is involved, I have very little hope that they're going to side with compassion and logic on this one. 
<sighs> yeah, if only there were more branches of the government to serve as a kind of check or balance to the Supreme Court. Maybe even one or two with an election coming up. Ah, well, if yeah, only. Right. And in deconversion news. That's that's, that's brilliant. That's that's, that's really solid. fucking good. Nobody can tell because you said it so good. It's deacon version. Version, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's so good. Thank you. The Catholic Church is finally getting around to addressing its extensive and horrifying history of child rape this week by excommunicating one of their victim's dads. Because nothing says owning up to your past mistakes like condemning other people to hell for them. Yeah, okay. That piece of context needs to be mentioned in every conversation you have with a Christian person. If they're not actively helping you find Jesus, they're letting you be tortured for eternity in their heads or they're lying and don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So first off, big thank you to everybody who sent this story in, but especially to Kitty who sent this to us first. Does an actual Kitty send us atheist news to scathingnews at gmail.com? Who knows? But whether or not you're an actual feline, you can send us news to scathingnews at gmail.com and we'll give you equal amounts of pets. Wait, what, what does it say on the whiteboard about offering listeners scritches, Eli? That's fair. That's fair. I apologize. Withdrawn. Right. So here's the story. Back in 2018, Deacon Scott Payton's son was sexually abused by their priest. The priest confessed and went to jail for seven years. The Paytons were paid a settlement by the church and they tried to move on with their lives. What the Paytons didn't expect was for the community they once served to shun them for the crime of speaking out which, of course, it did. Yeah, that community's being like, hey, man, you got the 50 shekels. You're being a real dick about it now. Yeah, right, but but so, but honestly, though, what about Catholicism made them think they weren't going to get shunned over this? Yeah, that's fair. So in 2023, Peyton resigned as a deacon, and they started attending an Anglican congregation instead. And that, combined with Peyton's public and vocal support for victims' rights, caused him to receive a letter of excommunication this week from Bishop J. Douglas Deshtotol of the Diocese of the Lafayette, saying, in part, quote, I am aware that your family has suffered a trauma, but the answer does not lie in leaving the most holy Eucharist. End real quote. The Eucharist? Really? You're going to lead with the magic cracker argument? That? Is bold. So wait, that's dumb. So they kicked him out of the church that he'd already stopped going to when it started shunning him. This is nothing to the third power, isn't it? Yeah. Now, to be clear, while the church is trying to use its barely covered, you went to a different church which hurt Jesus's feelings defense, that is obvious bullshit, right? Catholics don't excommunicate people who go to different churches. Hell, they make most people jump through hoops to stop being counted on church rosters if they were ever Catholic. No, this is about silencing someone for speaking out about the abuse their family suffered. But far more importantly, it's about punishing someone who dared to speak out for all victims, which was made all the more evident by the fact that while Peyton has been excommunicated, the priest who molested his son was not. Terrifying. Yep. Yeah. Their policy on whistleblowers is la la la, can't hear you. Wait, hold on. We can hear you. Go further away. You have to go because yes. we can hear it. Right. Well, and to be clear, th this is a logistical issue, not a moral one, right? Because if they kicked out every single priest that ever molested a kid, the entire religion would be two octogenarians in Finland going, hey, so you want to give the Jews back their art now or what? Right. Yeah, exactly. So this is obviously awful and it made even worse by Noah's News Above, where monsters who did this actually won a legal victory for their case at the state level. But if it's any comfort... Given how their parishioner numbers are dwindling and will continue to dwindle, soon enough, the Catholic Church won't have anyone left to kick out, victim or otherwise. I'm not comforted. Yeah, <laughs> me neither. And in Wedge Issues news, former ESPN anchor Sage Steele gave a Christian anti-vaxxer-themed speech at Liberty University last week. About that time, she got hit in the face with a golf ball by... <laughs> Satan, the Prince of Darkness. Yeah. Okay. YouTube video I can watch on repeat or it didn't happen, Sage. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I know you have more of this story to do, Heath, but I feel like any context is just going to diminish the feeling. Let's feelings just stop it right now. there. Right. Yeah, right. Got just... hit in face by a golf Pause ball. for a moment Satan. of silence. <laughs> <laughs> and a big thanks to Robert for the link. Scathingnews at gmail.com. And we especially enjoy stories that you send to that address about 
anti-vaxxer religious lunatics getting hit in the face in a funny way. Great work. Honestly, we are open to giving it its own email account. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you can provide. <laughs> so according to Sage Steele, she was the victim of religious persecution when ESPN took her off the air for 10 days in October of 2021 and pulled her off a handful of assignments. She claims the network was retaliating because she publicly criticized their policy of, you know, not spreading a global pandemic by having a vaccine mandate for their personnel. She told the audience at Liberty, quote, in order to keep my job at ESPN, owned by Disney, I'm going to pause for booing. I was pausing so you could boo. <laughs> I had to take the vaccine, end quote. She said, consider how far down the list of fireable offenses we really are here, right? In order to keep my job, I had to wear clothes. I had to bathe. I had to stop <laughs> making aggressive monkey noises at the customers. All of those would be more reasonable than the things she wanted to do because nobody dies in yep, those safer. Ones. Yeah, safer. Okay, here's where the story gets pretty interesting and delightful. Sage Steele went back to work after the 10 days, and despite all the persecution, she got assigned to cover the PGA Championship golf tournament. And that's when she got hit in the face with a golf ball and it knocked out eight of her teeth. Oh, guys, guys, I'm believing in God again. I'm <laughs> believing in God again. Okay, so according to the, you know, standard model of physics, it was a bad shot from golfer John Rahm. Or, or maybe it was a perfect shot. Yeah, <laughs> but according to Sage Steele, it was the supreme demon of the underworld who did it. But she didn't realize right away. At first, she got a message from God Here's the account she gave of the moments right after she got hit in the face. Quote, I had finally realized they're not going to be able to glue the teeth back in. They're not going to be able to put the flesh back in my lip. And I threw it on the ground. The flesh on your lip? <laughs> Sorry. The visual of her frustrated lip spike is the th is a fucking thing of beauty, right? and I want to thank you for it, Heath. <laughs> yeah. You're picturing it sticking to her finger like a booger, oh, right? Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought it was yeah. going to be more impactful. It's stuck. Uh -huh. All right. She continued. I sat there, and I realized that God doesn't want me to do this. God is telling me to be quiet. If they want you to say, go vaccine, everybody get it, say whatever they want. Because this is what happens. This is what happens when you're true to yourself, apparently. Then I realized that was not God talking to me. That was something else that was evil. That was the devil <laughs> oh my trying to God. scare me into silence because I had just filed this lawsuit. And I realized it was up to me. That hit me there in the mouth of all places for a reason. To make sure I didn't stay silent. End quote. She invoked opposite day to make that fucking work. Yep. God's like, actually, the message I was trying to send you was duck, but you blew it, you know? <laughs> okay. So she's saying the devil punched her in the mouth and told her to shut up. Guys, am, am I the devil? Okay. In many ways, yeah. <laughs> so just to recap, Liberty University paid for a speech about Lucifer, the goat man of eternal torment, hitting a lady in the face with a golf ball and then doing a God accent inside of that lady's <laughs> head to trick her into the evil plot called do modern medicine to prevent a global pandemic. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Liberty University paid for that, but they can't afford to meet even the most basic standards of safety for their campus. That they cannot pay for. And in NSW for M news, we've got some excellent news from Australia this week as the state of New South Wales passed a ban on gay conversion therapy. As well they should, for after all, just because you're down under doesn't mean you have to be down low. And you might be thinking, what's a big deal? Gay conversion therapy is a pseudoscientific practice so barbaric that even a few American states have gotten around to banning it. But this was no easy feat, my friends. No, the ban passed without amendment or exemption for religious bigots, but not without Herculean efforts from lawmakers who thanks to Australia's almost as silly as Britain's parliamentary rules, had to debate in a marathon overnight parliamentary session to get it done. Which means that several lawmakers in New South Wales had hours of pro-torturing gay children arguments. 
<sighs> okay, guys, I know it says we have to do like a sword kata over the sepulcher <laughs> and then roll the boulder to get the mousetrap thing. to Can we just ban the fake bigot science and do all that stuff tomorrow? It's 3 a.m. We'll just yeah. we'll do the magic spells later. They cannot now. Right. So first off, big thanks to Daniel and James who sent us this news as soon as it broke. I'd thank you for sending us news to scathingnews at gmail.com. But why thank you when I can marry you? and become a citizen of your attractive and healthcare-providing homeland. But yeah, this is a win through hard work. And with that hard work comes my favorite part of Australian politics. That's right, adorably informal statements by Australian politicians. The environmental minister and leader of the Legislative Council, Penny Sharp, had this to say about the bill. Quote, What New South Wales has done today is to say to our LGBTQ community that you are fine just the way you are, and that we will look after you, and that we will protect you. And Attorney General Michael Daly excellently added, conversion therapy proceeds on the basis that people in the LGBTQ plus community are broken. They need fixing, but we like them just the way they are. Yeah, now get cracking on the religious deconversion therapy. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm, hell, I'm even fine with straight conversion therapy, right? They, they always seem to be having more fun than us. So much more fun, yeah. You just got to try. And as I said before, this bill is the real deal, right? Here in the U.S., gay conversion therapists can often get around these bans by calling themselves religious counselors or bigot parents can send their kids out of state. But the legislation also provides redress to survivors through a civil pathway. And the NSW Anti-Discrimination Board can also disseminate information, conduct research, and hold public inquiries about conversion practices meaning the government has an actual means of enforcement against this shit, even if there's a cross on the wall of your office. Yes, that's fucking huge. That's what a law looks like when you actually mean it. And to be clear, none of our anti-conversion therapy laws look anything like that. Nope, they sure don't. So all in all, this is great news. Here's hoping Tasmania and the confusingly named South Australian states get in on the game sometime soon. Congratulations to everyone involved. And believe it or not, we're going to keep the good news coming and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucent. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Well, it looks like I get to give you one of those rare good news versions of this segment. And part of that is because of the diligent work of feminist activists all over the country. And some of it is because the bar is so goddamn low that hey, look, we get to keep one of our rights, qualifies as good news these days. So the right in question is the right to medical abortion, which was called into question by a recent lawsuit out of Texas. You'll remember this one. It's where the activist judge, whose only real qualifications for the bench was really hating abortion, ruled that he knew more about mifepristone than the FDA and all their stupid doctors and researchers and tried to ban its use nationally. The Supreme Court stepped in then and issued a temporary order that allowed it to remain available. Well, the court heard oral arguments about the case on Tuesday. And while we're going to have to wait a bit to hear the decision, every indication is that even the conservative wing of the court is skeptical of this. Possibly because the argument is that mifepristone is too dangerous, even though it's 10 times safer than Viagra which can be obtained by mail by collecting enough fucking cereal box tops at this point. But of course, bad arguments have never been enough to dissuade this court. And it's the first major challenge to abortion rights that the Supreme Court has heard since overturning Roe. So needless to say, I was holding my breath a bit over this one. Incidentally, if you're concerned about this issue and you're going to be at the American Atheist Annual Convention this weekend in Philly, I strongly urge you to check out friend of the show, Devin Graham's workshop on Friday about self-managed abortion. And before I let you go, I have another piece of holy shit, how is this good news, good news for you? This time out of the unlikely state of West Virginia. Though, to be fair, as much as you don't expect good feminism news out of West Virginia, this is exactly the type of good feminism news you'd expect out of there if you did. Because for the first time, it is now illegal in West Virginia to sexually assault somebody, even if she's your wife. So, yeah, back in 1976, West Virginia repealed the state's marital exemption for rape. In case you needed a reminder just how recent this whole concept of women's having rights really is. But West Virginia didn't want to be too progressive when it came to banning rape, so they just banned sexual assault. 
not sexual abuse. That is, the marital exemption remained in place in cases of non-consensual sexual touching. And it's worth noting here, not that this isn't already egregious, that includes spouses who are separated. Or rather, it did include spouses who are separated. Because last week, West Virginia's governor signed Senate Bill 190 into law and removed all remaining marital exemptions. And if your reaction to this is a horrified, they're just getting around to that now, just imagine how the advocates that have been working towards this law removal for over a decade feel. So yeah, tentative, overdue good news that shouldn't have to exist this week, which is as good as you're going to get out of me. So I'll wrap it up there and hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines, in Haiti crime news, is it time to recolonize Haiti? What? That's a real question <laughs> and also a thought crime and a hate crime that was tackled last week by three of America's dumbest thought criminals and hate criminals, Jack Posobiec, Blake Neff, and Charlie Kirk. Woof. Yep. They have a surprisingly self-aware show called Thought Crime, and the title of a recent <laughs> episode was Seriously recolonize Haiti? And the answer to that question was, against all odds, dumber than you're thinking. Wow. So they had a racist, sexist, homophobe, a sexist, racist, homophobe, and a homophobic, racist, sexist. Well, at least they're committed to diversity. Okay. But but if we're allowed to guess, is it based on cornering a tropical beverage market? Because I think that's what they think it is. <laughs> all right. And a big thanks to Will for the link. Scathingnews at gmail.com. So, you might be wondering at this point, what and <laughs> who? And those are great questions. Congrats on the nice little slice of the internet you've found. I used to do the same thing to, you know, thick bulldog in a hammock, guy falls down funny, intro level porn, delightful little piece of the internet. But now I have a job that means I know about these three neck beards come to life out of a cauldron and I know about this story. So for those who aren't familiar, Jack Posobiec is a so-called journalist who got his start by being mad about Game of Thrones on a blog. Yep. He did. Blake Neff was Tucker Carlson's lead writer until Blake got fired for being, I can't stress this enough, too racist for Tucker Carlson. And Charlie Kirk is the founder of Students for Trump and Turning Point USA, which we've talked about. Those are both Christian right organizations that go around the country visiting universities and turning angry white incels into angry white incels with talking points that they can repeat. Yep. And, and also, we can't fail to mention this. Charlie Kirk has a tiny little island of face amidst a vast ocean of head. Right. It's like every time he lies, his face gets smaller. It's weird. Right. Or the head gets bigger. Yeah. Every photo of Charlie Kirk looks like someone did a mean Photoshop of Charlie Kirk. Yep. Yeah. Like somebody doesn't know how to do the zoom in thing with the pinch on, mm -hmm. on the fingers mm -hmm. and yeah, just exactly. got a little piece, just his face <laughs> part. Yeah. So now these guys all have a show together and they're pretty sure that Christianity is being threatened by Haiti in the form of levitation and cat people. Huh. Here's how they got there. This is a real exchange of human sentences in the world. Real quotes from real Heath, quote. everybody. Real, real quotes. quotes. Charlie Kirk. It's important to note that Haiti is legitimately infested with demonic voodoo. Would we say important? <laughs> Jack Posobiec responds, they came up with these demonic occult practices that are going on. In many cases, completely subverting Christianity and Christian symbols for use in these practices. You'll have cases where, you know, the killing and, and the ritual killing and the ritual and ingestion of flesh, let's just say it, ingestion of flesh is done as part of these rituals. Do you have any takes on slavery that I might be interested in? <laughs> Said nobody at all. He continued in answer to nobody at all. During the slave revolt, one of the leaders of this was actually was himself a witchcraft shaman of sorts and was, they would sacrifice animals, pass around the cup of blood to kind of give them the blood rage. They cheated. They <laughs> cheated during the slave revolt. <laughs> <laughs> and then they would go off and start killing all of the plantation owners in answer to that question. Yes, they would. So, so starting point is on the side of plantation owners because the slaves were doing religion wrong. 
Right, Correct. right. And, and secondary point, we would have totally kicked their asses if yeah, they right. hadn't used yes, demon yes, magic. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, back to Charlie Kirk in response about the sad plight of the plantation owners. He said, I don't know if it's fixable. I've talked to missionaries and missionaries that have gone there, and they say they've seen the darkest stuff that a human being can see. He means black people. I think he means by In fact, history, yeah. I know people that went to Haiti passively as like agnostic atheists. Ah, I'm in Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you go somewhere yeah. passively? Were they kidnapped? <laughs> Perhaps he meant kidnapped. I don't know. Agnostic atheists went there. He continued. Missed my stop on the E yeah. train. <laughs> and then, took a wrong turn at Albuquerque. Yeah. <laughs> and they came back searching for Jesus because they saw like legit demonic activity. Oh, yeah. Lots of people witness the depths of human poverty and suffering and want to join the side of the omnipotent guy that allows it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so at this point, Blake Neff had a question <laughs> because that was nonsense. Blake Neff said, well, do you, did, did they say any more? <laughs> <laughs> sure, man. This is imaginary. They said as much as you yeah, want. Yeah, they said you whatever, you whatever you want, you want bud. <laughs> Charlie Kirk answered, yes, there was one guy who saw somebody who literally didn't sleep for two weeks and would just like run, literally run around and not sleep for two weeks, like ran through the whole island with like supernatural type capacity. What? There are claims that people have seen like quasi levitation stuff. Quasi levitation? Quasi I think you're just talking about falling. Yeah, <laughs> that's just falling, man. Kirk also added, there were common stories about people turning into cats at night, which I don't know. They all knew someone that turned into cats. Again, I'm not sure about that. I haven't heard that. Oh, now he's skeptical, quote. everybody. Now he's <laughs> skeptical. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Do they turn into multiple cats or just one cat each? The way he phrased These that. These are yeah. the questions. It would Thank be you, ridiculous. No we need the, the clarification on that. So, Here's my big takeaway. We should have thought crimes. And people like Charlie Kirk and Jack Posobiec and Blake Neff are the reason. If Orwell met these guys, he'd be like, yeah, whatever. Two plus two is five and we arrest them now. That's fine. Well, yep. see, we would have <laughs> said, have I don't crimes. think that counts as thought. I don't think. You're, it's, it's, you're fine. <laughs> you're good. Could burn some books. And in Thief in the Night News. One of the most reliable meme firms for atheists is the tax revenue our country loses through church exemptions. And the claims on this vary widely from the ridiculous meme that claimed taxing churches would mean Americans would only have to pay 3% income tax to the even more ridiculous claim on the other end of the scale that is the legal basis for our current system. But what about the money that they just straight up steal? Well, that was the focus of researchers from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity, and they pegged that number at around $86 billion in 2024 alone. Okay, <sighs> I mean, considering people gave about $1.3 trillion to churches last year throughout the world, I feel like the stealing number is more like um, $1.3 trillion. Right. $1.3 yes. trillion. No, dollars that's is fair, yeah, math. To, to clarify, because like, yes, every dollar received by telling people that there's a fictional forever torture place that they're buying their way out of. All of that is theft. But that's not how the Center for the Study of Global Christianity sees things. The hell you say? Right, yeah. <laughs> no, they're, they're just talking about when a preacher pockets a handful of cash from the collection plate or tells the parishioners that this collection is going to go to the cemetery maintenance fund and actually is used to refurbish his pool or whatever. So what we're really talking about here is when they steal from their own theft and even that subset of their larceny amounts to over $80 billion a year. Coincidentally, that's the number that Oxfam estimates it would take to eliminate extreme poverty worldwide. Cool. Yeah, that's also almost exactly the value of taxes that churches avoid paying every year yep. thanks to religious exemptions in the U.S. alone. Right. Or just under half of Elon Musk's net worth. So there's a lot of ways. <laughs> now, it's probably already occurred to you that this is a really tough number to pin down. Churches, after all, don't report the amount of money that they stole from this week's collection plate. And hell, they, they don't even report how much money they got 
from this week's collection plate. So even the imperfect means that we have for tracking fraud and typical nonprofits are useless here. What's more, even when financial fraud is discovered in a church, it's almost always swept under the rug to avoid hurting the church's reputation. And since they don't have any requirements for financial disclosure, covering it up is it's just not telling anyone about it. That's it. You're done. Right. So what this study really did was just look at the average estimated amount of fraud and multiply that amount by the amount that churches take in. That is to say, this astronomical number is based on the dubious assumption that Christian leaders aren't more corrupt than average people and that the ease with which you can commit fraud never tempts you to commit fraud. In other words, you can double this number and it's still a low ball. And also what I'm learning is that my grandma missed her calling in the ministry, but <laughs> not too late for me, nope. Cam Cam, not too late for me. Nope. We can carry on the family tradition. And in J double back news, the Jehovah's Witnesses have rolled back a few of their insane cult rules to downright Reagan-esque levels of sanity, which is to be celebrated, I, I guess, because... Less insanity is always a good thing, but man, there is still a lot left yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Deregulation gave us like Enron and uh, global economic crises, but it works great for religion. And so good rule of thumb, if your thing makes deregulation look good every time, your thing is bad. Right. That's a bad thing. Thing is bad. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to dialing this stuff back, Eli, you got to keep in mind that if they dialed the insanity all the way back, they just disappear. So. That is true. They do. They do. First off, big thanks to Sherry D'Souza over at the Recovering Woo! From Religion Foundation for this info. If you're not aware of Sherry from her work with Recovering From Religion, you might know her for inflicting the plague that is Vegemite on unsuspecting and innocent podcasters at a variety of convention events. But... Despite this punitive nature, thanks to her, we got a bit of a scoop on this. And not only was she the first to bring this to my attention, but as of this writing, I haven't seen many news agencies covering it. Oh, my God. Even the vegan is talking shit about your poop colored yeast spread, Australia. Just admit it. It's, it's <laughs> gross. It's fucking gross. Just admit that and move on. It looks like it's going to make Spider-Man evil. Like, I don't know. It it's it's yeah. very scary. <laughs> yeah. So let's get to the charges. Men can now wear beards. Ooh. That change actually took place a few months ago, but it's worth including in our summary. The video and article Sherry sent us doesn't specify a reason, but I'm pretty sure there was an awkward, what do you mean Jesus had one conversation yeah. at a meeting and this was the result? Well, it hasn't changed the way Baptists feel about men with long hair yet. Let me tell you. <laughs> okay. It feels like the default policy about beards should be the opposite. Like, okay, I know most people, they're fine shaving, but just in the abstract, I'm going to scrape over my entire face and neck with a sword it should be the <laughs> thing that requires a waiver, if anything. Sure. Right, right. By the way, folks, Heath looks like Deadpool when he gets done shaving. Just so he does. You're he does. He's, he's pink. That's why I keep the beard. And while you're letting the boys get sloppy, men also no longer have to wear ties or suit jackets at meetings or while door knocking. Ooh, ooh, a change I'm guessing j Dub south of the equator are very grateful for. But... But if they have a part in the read-along sing-along, they do still have to suit up. <laughs> yeah, and if you forget your jacket, they give you a comically large or small one, like an obnoxious <laughs> restaurant. Right, yeah. It's the worst. Yeah, like the magic castle, yeah. And I know what you're thinking, podcast listener. Okay, those seem like reasonable and relatively minor changes. Well, how about a little scandal for you? Because now, J-Dub women can wear pants. <gasps> That's right. Tightly wrapped legs all over this place. It's straight up 1950s <laughs> sluttery in the J-Dub's halls now. Yeah. So, Sherry, if you know anyone from the cult, any women in the cult, I will personally provide very fancy assless chaps for anyone who's interested okay. and is allowed to wear pants <laughs> There now. you go. It's, I've never understood Christian's insistence on skirts, right? Surely the more prudish garment is the one you can't fuck in, right? I mean, I That's can fucking not, pants. Yeah, you can I, yeah do this is you want. silly. Pants, We'd like to, to apologize you. for no illusions. You can go over the podcast. pants, <laughs> under the pants, through the pants. Crazy. The pants are coming off to the extent that you're fucking. Not me. Not for me. They're not. Nope. Because I'm not a quitter. I like to move them up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now to the less fun part. And I don't just mean that image that he gave you. <laughs> if you know about Jehovah's Witnesses, it's probably because they're the ones who don't do birthdays or Halloween, but they're also the ones who famously shun members, friends, and even family members who stop following the church. And the 
The good news is those rules have been relaxed. If someone has been disfellowshipped for anything other than apostasy, you can contact them for the sole purpose of inviting them to a meeting. Oh, wow. <laughs> and when said disfellowship person comes to the meeting, you're allowed to say a greeting to them. The bad news is that the rules are incredibly explicit that you cannot do this for apostates and that you're not allowed to have like a long conversation with them if they come to the meeting. Hey, yeah, Dave, thanks for inviting me. Hold on. Are you are you holding a Scrabble timer that you just turned <laughs> over? What are, what are you doing? Rules are rules. Right. So add to that that many people who were disfellowshipped by their families like 20 years ago are now hearing from the families that abandoned them, inviting them to a meeting. It's um, it's not quite the gesture of kindness I think it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. And and as great as being shunned by Jehovah's Witnesses sound, like, like I want in on that, but it's a whole different thing when that includes your entire fucking family. So, yeah. So uh, that's progress, I guess. Uh, next step, shorts. Only Jehovah and his terrifying army of CGI children will know. <laughs> And finally tonight, in Please Come Back to Yankee Stadium, where you almost got beat up by 46,000 New Yorkers news. Yeah, We have a story about Ted Cruz. Yes, we do. But more importantly, it's about federal appeals court nominee Adil Manji, who would become the first ever Muslim person to hold that position in the history of the country if he gets confirmed. From everything I've read, Manji is highly qualified and therefore a threat to Ted Cruz and the Republican Party, of course. So Ted Cruz and his GOP bigot squad turned the confirmation hearings into the Islamophobia lightning round of questions. Well, to be fair, that's just how Ted talks, though. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what we got from Ted Cruz at the hearing. He started by accusing Manji of being anti-Semitic. Just for the record, Manji has the full support of the Anti-Defamation League. So He does! Might be wrong about that, Ted Cruz. Uh, Ted Cruz does not have the support. No, of the he doesn't. He does, he does not. <laughs> from there, Cruz demanded that Manji, quote, condemn the atrocities of the Hamas terrorists right now. And Jesus fucking it, it, Gross, yeah. This happens to Muslim people all the time here in the U.S., especially when they're not white, even when they're not facing a panel of bigot senators for a confirmation. It's more like, you know, for the people not at the panel, it's more like, oh, uh, yeah, welcome to Fridays. Here's the menu. Condemn terrorism right now. I'll be back to take your drink order right after that. <laughs> it's absurd, and it would never happen to a white person. So... In response to that extremely offensive moment, California State Senator Scott Weiner, who happens to be Jewish, called out Ted Cruz and tweeted, this is straight up Islamophobia. That's no different than grilling a Jewish nominee about Israel's conduct. Are they asking other nominees the same questions? Of course not. Only the Muslim nominee. I feel like Ted Cruz would ask a black nominee to condemn shit that's happening in Africa, Scott. I don't I don't mean to be. Yeah, he sure would. Yeah. In Scott's defense, metaphors are hard when the bad guys are doing every possible instance of that would be as stupid as blank. So I sympathize. <laughs> right. I sympathize. So here's where it gets fun, because Ted Cruz goes from stupid bigot to stupid bigot getting thoroughly embarrassed as he is wont to do. It's fun for us. He responded by accusing Scott Weiner of, quote, getting thrown out of Congress for sending naked pictures of himself. Uh -huh. <laughs> Cruz, oh, <laughs> Cruz was thinking of Anthony Weiner, which is also spelled differently on the last name, uh -huh. who is a different human being. Different person. Just yep. with a similar last name. Uh, fun fact, Anthony Weiner was me and Heath's representative when all that shit happened. Oh, yeah, and mine, and mine, and I can confirm that he was nailing the interests of I, his constituency. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Consensual dick pic exchange. <laughs> so look, I get it, Ted. Names are tricky. And, and t Ted Cruz is a crazy Scientologist who could barely do a single bartending trick in that cocktail movie. But <laughs> maybe do a quick Google next time because you might have realized that Scott Wiener's name is not, in fact, Anthony. And also that he was your literal classmate in law school. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Speaking of which, Scott Wiener responded by tweeting, Ted, Remember when we went to law school together and everyone hated you? And oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. No response from Ted Cruz on that. Okay, I bet he does remember it though. Sure does. He does though. <laughs> he does. But thanks to that exchange, we did get a fun reminder about a story involving another classmate of Ted Cruz. In 2016, 
Cruz defended a bill in Texas that would ban the sale of dildos and other sex toys because he's the literal absence of pleasure and joy in the entire <laughs> universe. Yeah. And that's when his freshman year roommate at Princeton made one of my favorite posts of all time. It said, quote, Ted Cruz thinks people don't have the right to stimulate their genitals. I was his college roommate. That would be a new belief of his. <laughs> <laughs> And on that reminder of the 28th most embarrassing thing that ever happened in Ted Cruz's career, I guess we could wrap the headlines for the night. <laughs> Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, Jesus will be back and sassier than ever. Hey, podcast listener, do you love god-awful movies? Well, then buckle your buckle because we're bringing god-awful movies live back to Salt Lake City on August 3rd. Those were funeral potatoes. We'll have all the live shenanigans you know and love, plus platinum and VIP seating. But don't wait. Tickets are already half gone, and this show will sell out, and then you'll be sad. GodawfulmoviesLive.com. Here we come, Salt Lake City. Temple Square will never be the same. To be clear, that was just the end of the ad. We are not going to blow up Temple Square. And he was like, actually, Telegram is where the best reporting is being done. Oh, yikes. I know. What do you even say to that? Hey, guys. Yeah, Are you ready for Bible Peace Theater? Oh, you mean the part of the show where we act out the Bible so our listeners don't have to read it? Yeah, we sure are. Oh, yeah. Uh, Don, when, when did you get here? Oh, Eli ordered me on Uber package delivery. You can do that? Yeah, they're pretty short on cash these days. Got on it. Okay, so uh, where were we? Uh, Matthew, Jesus was miracling. Right. And he's going to keep miracling by curing the blind. Excuse me, are you Jesus by any chance? Yes. We were wondering if you could cure us. Oh, that depends. Do you believe I can cure you? Is that like a requirement? Yes. Huh, weird. But, uh, yeah, okay. Well, there you go. Thanks for the, um, extremely conditional miracle. No problem. And then Jesus is going to cure a dumb guy. I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden. Jesus magic. I just realized endangering the lives and well-being of the people I pretend to care about over personal politics is definitionally evil. No problem. You were like chock full of demons. He probably only did that because he and Satan are buddies. Shut up, Pharisee. Nobody asked you. Just saying. So Jesus traveled all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel, and healing every sickness and disease among the people. Oh, phew. That was quite a day of miracling. I'm pooped. Sure was, Jesus. You did great, though. I just wish there were more of me to go around, you know? The mm -hmm. harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Yeah. If only we had your powers and we could do miracles, too. Ooh, that gets me an idea. Introducing the Twelve Apostles with the power against unclean spirits to cast out demons and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. They are Simon, who is called Peter. I've got an ear for evil, ear. Andrew, Peter's brother. Really? That's how I'm introduced? James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. I didn't even get my own intro. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican. Ah, I knew having a job would pay off. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Okay, that feels phone booky. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Spoilers! They are the Twelve Disciples. All right, disciples, now that you're gathered, are you ready for your mission? Absolutely. Oh, go. Okay. Go amongst the Jews and tell them how great I am. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. You know the drill. You got it, Jesus. Oh, oh, but stay away from Gentiles and Samaritans. Because they what? don't need our help? No, they're just 
Icky. Little bad vibes, man. Oh, don't take money or shoes or more than one coat. That feels impractical. Yeah, wh- where are we going to stay? Oh, when you just get to a city, just ask around for who's worthy and then stay at their house. When you get to their house, do a salute. And if they don't let you in, shake off the dust when you leave and it'll be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. Feels a little harsh. Wow. You'll be hunted like sheep by wolves and brothers will kill brothers. Fathers will condemn their sons to death in your name and you'll be brought to trial. But don't worry, the hair on your head is numbered and you are worth way more than sparrows. Okay, he lost me. Are you guys following this? It feels like the speech took a turn Mm -hmm. again. If you serve me, I'll say nice things to my dad about you. But if you deny me, I'll deny you to my dad. So many threats. A lot of threats. Everything he says. Look, I have not come for peace, but with a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. (laughs) <laughs> that last one won't take much work, am I right? Dude, huh? dude not the time. I'm, ju- I'm trying to lighten the mood. Classic. Anyone who loves their mom or their child more than me is not worthy of me. Super toxic and bad. Just everything. Okay, everybody be nice to my followers or you'll go to hell because I'm like the most important person ever. Got it. So now that Jesus is done psychotically ranting about his enemies list, he gets a message from John the Baptist in prison. Excuse me, Jesus? Oh, hey, where's John? At jail. Oh, what for? Yeah, he yelled at the king for marrying his brother's wife. Oh, that John. Always yelling at someone, you know how he is. Anyway, how can I help? Yeah, well, he wants to know if you're the Messiah or if we should like... Keep looking. Oh, I don't know. Why don't you guys hang out and tell John I'm like healing the sick and making the lame walk, you know, that sort of thing. Sorry, that's a really coy answer from someone who just gave a speech about how people who don't think you're the son of God are going to be punished for all eternity. Or is it? Yeah. Yes. It is. Hey, everyone. So those messengers remind me, I wanted to tell you all about John the Baptist. Oh, all right. John the Baptist. John the Baptist yeah. So, you know, how you're walking through the desert and you're like, what's that? A tree? A man clothed in soft garments? Or wait, could it be a prophet? Yes. This is a weird intro. What? Well, that's right. John the Baptist isn't just a prophet. He is the best person Ever. Wait, Jesus, aren't you the best person ever? Yeah, I thought you were literally God. Okay, shut up. John is amazing. Since John was born, heaven has been like, whoa, that guy is so awesome. What are we even going to do? That's how awesome he is, you know? So many questions about that whole thing just now. And like, John fasts and everyone's like, oh, he's not eating because of demons. But then I eat and everyone's like, look at him eating. You know, you can't win. What? You doing a stand-up bit? Oh, okay. Speaking of which, here's a list of cities that I'm mad at. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethesda. For if the Man, mighty Jesus works, spends which a ton of you, time condemning people for not following him. Yeah, I, I think one of the most important things we can do with this segment is illustrate to people that Jesus is not some wise teacher. He's just very clearly interested in everybody worshiping him, and he's not particularly fond of anyone who doesn't. Okay, but isn't like the wise teacher myth useful? I don't think so. Uh, no, I, th- I thought that made like better Christians because they. I mean, maybe for people who are already inclined to seek out good advice in their religion, but the fact that the Bible agrees with extremists is a lot more harmful. Exactly. Like, at best, the myth helps Christians feel better about not giving up their religion. Yeah, and a lot of the time, they're giving money to Christians who do believe in the Bible and are a lot more extreme. Yeah, I I guess that's fair. Speaking of which, did you guys read that magazine Senior Pets emailed to us? It has some wild stuff. I blocked his email. Yeah, oh, that's smart. I think I'm going to do that. Whatever the sun will reveal him. Hey, Jesus. Oh, fuck, it's the Pharisees. 
Hey, Pharisees, what do you guys want now? We just saw your disciple picking wheat. You're supposed to keep the Sabbath holy, right? Well, well, that's true, they are. But you know who's holier than the Sabbath? Me. Just like when David went into temple and ate the priest bread. That story doesn't seem related. Yeah, you can't just break all the rules of Judaism because you say you're the Messiah. Oh, I can, and it's pretty much my whole thing. Excuse me, Jesus. Oh, hey there. Uh, you'll notice I have this withered hand. Oh, yeah, let me take care of that for wait, you. Wait, Jesus? Fucking Pharisees, what? Are you allowed to heal on the Sabbath? Yeah, doesn't that count as work? No, I'm God. I get to do God stuff whenever I want. Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. Oh my God, I'm gonna need to get one of these numbers things. Yes, can I help you? Uh, yeah, my cousin is deaf and dumb and it's now, so I think that means he's probably full of demons. Oh yeah, full of demons for sure. Bing, bang, boom. I'm cured. Great, you're welcome. Bye. I mean, sure. Or... Oh my God, Pharisees, okay, what okay, now? I'm, I'm just saying, maybe you're the son of the God, or maybe uh, you know Beelzebub super well. Why would Beelzebub help me cast out demons when he is a demon? A house divided its against itself cannot stand. Wait, wait, that Jesus quote from the Bible is him addressing hypothetical demon drama? It, uh, yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do... Do Christians know that? They do not, no. <laughs> it's stupid. Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay, everyone listen. I have a very important announcement. I just remembered or realized or something. It's not clear. There is one unforgivable sin. Wow. Yeah, every other sin but this one shall be Forgiven. So this one must be really bad, huh? Oh, it is the worst. What? What is it? Is it? Is it rape? Child murder? Worse. The unforgivable sin is denying the Holy Spirit. You guys. Sorry, denying the what? what? Okay, so it's like ghost me. I haven't explained it yet. But did you wanna? Preferably before you explain that it's the unforgivable sin. That'd be great. No, no. All that matters is that if you deny the Holy Spirit in word or thought, your sins will never be forgiven. That's all. Thought? Wait, so, so it's a thought crime too? Uh-huh, thought crime too, yep. Okay, and, and the fact that you were just arguing with the Pharisees has nothing to do with it. Oh, no, no, not at all. I just, I just remembered. You just remembered that the only unforgivable sin is questioning your godliness right after someone questioned your godliness? Mm-hmm. This is a bad book. Yup. All right, well, with a quick reminder that the bad guy in this book does eventually get what's coming to him. We're going to close it off there, but there's still more Matthew to come in the next installment of Bible Peace Theater. <laughs> Before we return to our coffins, I want to urge you one more time to lock in your ticket to see us live in Salt Lake City on August 3rd. We're in a smaller theater than normal, and it's in danger of selling out early. And your absence would greatly fuck up the vibe of the show. So, you know, get on that. Check the show notes. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show Citation Data, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't bestow upon this episode its ceremonial wreath if I neglect to thank Heath Enright for being so hot, Eli Bosnick for being so cool, and Lucinda Illusions for being just right. Also want to thank Don Ford for being not just the voice of fantasy and adventure, but our voice of fantasy and adventure. I also want to thank Mark for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. And Mara, consider how much trust I'm putting in you, assuming that what you said was Japanese for the Farnsworth quote. For all I know, you were calling upon the Japanese-speaking listeners to rise up against us. Also, Mara would like to encourage you to support your local teachers' union, as would I. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best bipeds, Jessica, Dan, Dietrich, Kieran, Christopher, and Jamila. 
Jessica and Dan, who are sharper than Excalibur, Dietrich and Kieran, who are so smart, Ludwig von Siegfried tried to get them, and Christopher and Jamila, who are so brainy, anthropomorphic rhinos and boars asked them what to do. Together, these six sexy secularists selected securing sacrilege this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give some to us, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but your money is too inflated to fit through the internet tubes, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson handles all of that for us, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Uh, nope. Oh, that sounded like a good one. Yeah, the yeah but the beginning it, it, it was, but then hitched. it cracked. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. All right, let me see if I can recapture it, but without the puberty. Here we go. Catch that magic. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.